Well, welcome. It is now 1121. So now everyone who is here on time is here. So welcome to an introduction to Redis for developers. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, which I suspect unless you're with the Vonage folks, it's probably all of you. Uh, I'm Steve Lorello. I am a developer advocate at Redis. Um, you can follow me on Twitter at slorello or follow me on GitHub at slorello89. And there are tons of cool Redis examples in my GitHub, uh, my GitHub page for those of you who want to come check them out. So before I give a talk, I usually like to give everyone a little bit of an overview, a little bit of an agenda of what we're going to be covering on a particular day. Uh, today, we're going to be introducing Redis, right? So probably the first question we shouldn't answer is, what is Redis? And then after that, we'll look at some of the major use cases. We'll you know, briefly go over some of the major use cases that folks use Redis for. And then we'll talk about the major Redis data structures and sort of how they build Redis. Then we'll look at some Redis design patterns. Uh, we'll look at using Redis in your app and apps. And then finally, we're going to be looking at some of the major Redis gotchas and anti-patterns that some uh, CM people get. And then if we have time at the end, we're going to have a really entertaining choice to make because my, my title's not actually developer advocate. It's the .NET developer advocate. So you all are going to have a choice between seeing me code in .NET or in be very entertained as I try to code in Java. So, because I know this is a Java conference and I want to, I want to be very inclusive of you all. So what is Redis? Well, Redis actually stands for remote dictionary server. That's actually where the acronym comes from. It's an acronym. It's a NoSQL database. And some of the key features of it is that it's completely in memory and that it's a key value store. And one of the other really key features of it is that it's actually single thread. And this becomes really important when we're going to be talking about acid in a little bit and the acidity of Redis. And because of all this, it's blazingly fast. And if you all notice, there's a picture of a dog here. And if you're wondering why that is, that's my Greyhound, honey. She is a retired racer and she's really fast. And the nice thing, the nice things that I really like about Redis are that it's fast and that it's pretty easy to use. And because of that, it's really beloved by developers. As a matter of fact, for I think the last three years running in the Stack Overflow survey, it's the most beloved uh, database by developers. So another thing that Redis is, is acidic. And this is the thing that we get asked probably more than anything else when it comes to using Redis as anything more than a cache. And I'll just go over the acidity of Redis real quick. So atomicity. Well, Redis is single threaded. And all of the Redis commands that you can execute against Redis are completed atomically. So if you issue a Redis command, it either it, it either completes or it doesn't, and that's all done, done atomically. And then for grouping, grouping together commands, you have two different paradigms, basically transactions and scripts, which we'll talk about a little bit later. For consistency, well, this actually depends a lot on your different your deployment and configuration. The a single instance of Redis. So if you're just running, running one, it, we kind of joke that if you're running one, run, one Redis instance, your, uh, your app, it, your Redis instance is perfectly atomic, consistent, isolated, and durable all at the same time. But for single instances, they're always consistent. If you have read only replication, you're guaranteed eventual consistency. And you can actually uh, enforce strong consistency by using the wait command after a particular set of commands that you issue against it. And so far as isolation is concerned, well, you know, Redis is single threaded, so there's not really anything else that's going to be able to run concurrent, uh, concurrently with it, uh, with any command that you issue. So it's isolated, so there's no concurrency. And then for durability, and this is the one we get a lot, it's like, oh, Redis is in memory, so there's no way that it's durable. You can only store really volatile stuff in here. Well, the entire data set in Redis is stored in memory. That's true. It's always loaded into memory at any given time. But there's actually two different durability models that you can use when you're using Redis to persist it to the disk. Uh, you can use an AOF, which is a append-only file, or you can use an RDB, which stands for a Redis database file. Just getting into those two little uh, those two things a little bit. An AOF file, the append-only file, is with each command that you issue to Redis. Redis writes that command basically to the append-only file. And then if there is a disaster and Redis 
breaks down or your server dies or something, you could basically just reload Redis from the AOF file. And basically Redis is just gonna run through all of the uh, commands that you issued up to that point with some compaction to get you back to the state that you were in beforehand. Now, the trick is, the trade-off is that the AOF file isn't always flush to the disk uh, constantly. There's three different paradigms that you can use to basically decide when the uh, AOF file is flushed to the disk. It's basically buffered in memory, and until it's flushed, it, it's not actually on the, in the AOF file yet. You just might have to wait a little bit. And this fsync policy here, which is a configuration option in Redis, basically determines what, you're, what policy you're gonna use for this synchronization. Always, which means that you will synchronously flush every time to the disk, and that makes your Redis database fully durable with a trade-off of obviously performance because you have to do IO synchronously every time you issue a command to Redis, which means you're effectively storing everything on the disk. There's every sec, which means that every second on a background thread, it's gonna flush the data to, your, uh, to the disk. So it's gonna flush that every second. So your greatest loss window is a second basically. And then there's the no option. And the no option you might think means it's not gonna use the AOF file, it doesn't. The no option means that it's just gonna let the operating system decide when it's gonna uh, flush to the disk. So the RDB file is a little bit different than an AOF file. An RDB file is basically just a snapshot of the database at any given point in time. And you can take these by configuring Redis to take them in intervals, or you can actually issue a command to tell Redis to create the AOF file and in a background, uh, on a background, I think it's a background process. I don't think it's a background thread. Somewhere in the background, it's gonna do it. It's just not blocking uh, the Redis server while it's doing that. And the nice thing about RDB files is that they're more compact and they're easier to ingest than AOF files. AOF files, as you can imagine, you're getting commands. At Redis, we, we measure the speed of commands in microseconds rather than milliseconds. So your throughput can be quite high on commands. So the AOF file, you can imagine, can get kind of big. You can pack it every once in a while to make it a little smaller, but it's, it, it's this big thing that you have to contend with. And having an RDB file is just quicker to ingest in case of a disaster or fail, uh, failure. And that puts a lot less strain on the operating system than the AOF file. And it does, but it, the, the big trade-off obviously is if you have a wider interval or you're just you know telling it to uh, take the snapshot whenever, you have a higher potential for data loss. So the next thing I'd like to talk about in this what is Redis section are the Redis deployment models. Well, there's Redis standalone. And Redis standalone is just one instance of Redis. So you just do a... Uh, Redis server and just start up Redis. Now, the nice thing about this is it's really simple. There's nothing else you have to think about other than what commands you're gonna to issue to Redis and how you're gonna configure Redis when you're dealing with this. But the downside is it doesn't have any high availability capability and you can't horizontally scale it. The only way that you can scale it out is by vertically scaling and increasing the size of the machine that you're on. And this is what a deployment of a Redis standalone instance looks like. It's just one instance of Redis. Redis Sentinel, and I'm sorry, I, I hope this isn't like a faux pas, but I figure that I would use the Queen's Garden here because they're kind of sentinels and uh, guarding the Queen in England. And hopefully that's not like offensive or a faux pas or anything. I don't think, I, I checked with some British friends of mine that said it's fine, you're, you're good to use it. But Redis Sentinel is basically having replication for high availability. So. A Redis Sentinel has one writable primary, or uh, we use the term master. I'm not going to get into that whole thing, but uh, we use the term master. So one writable master, and then you have many read over uh, read only replicas. So you can replicate a Redis instance many times to use uh, use this with Sentinel. And Sentinels uh, are these background Redis instances that are running on the same machines as your uh, master and replicas, and they handle all the high availability and failover capabilities of the Sentinel, I don't wanna say cluster, but the Sentinel group. And this is sort of what a Sentinel deployment looks like. You have, you have your master server with a, with a Sentinel and you have your replicas, each with Sentinels, 
And the Sentinels all keep an eye on all the mas uh, on the master and all the replicas, just to make sure everything is kind of alive. And if they decide in a quorum that something has died, basically they fail over to a new instance of it. Then we get into Redis cluster and Redis cluster is basically what I like to call horizontal scaling in hard mode. Okay. So Redis cluster is sort of like a Redis Sentinel in that it has replicas, but the key space now Redis is a key value store. The key space is split across multiple shards. So it's on different shards, potentially on different machines across a wide array, a, a, a wide array of the cluster, allowing you to more, uh, have more scaling when it comes to your rights. Now, each key that you send to Redis, so like when you, when you issue commands, and we'll get into the commands later, when you issue a command to Redis, the component, a major component of them is their key. That key is basically deterministically hashed to create a slot. And whichever slot that key maps to is the uh, set of master and replica shards that are going to uh, handle all the operations for that key. Now, shards become responsible for a group of slots. Now, this allows you to horizontally scale reads and writes across a cluster and multi, but, but this is a, there's actually a big trade-off here in that multi-key operation. So if you want to perform an operation on two keys, um, they have to both be on the same shard or you can't operate on both of them at the same time. So that's the big trade-off with Redis cluster. And now this is sort of what a Redis cluster looks like. You have different ranges of slots. And those different ranges of slots have a primary shard uh, or a primary instance that is responsible for all the writes on those shards. And then you have these read-only replicas, which are just kind of hanging out in the background, waiting, uh, either listening for reads, because you can read from them, the read-only replicas, or you can, um, or if the primaries die, you can just promote them to the new primary and they'll, they'll be okay. Um, a trick with Redis cluster and with Redis Sentinel for that matter is that you always want to have an odd number of instances. And can anyone think of why you'd want to have an odd number of instances? Split, split brain. Yes. Split brain. So if we had eight, if we just remove this one down here and we just took off four of these and took four of them offline, the other four wouldn't be able to determine if they have a quorum to elect a new set of primaries. And then we get to Redis cloud, which I like to call infinite scaling in easy mode. And that is you have basically us Redis manage your cluster for you. So you don't have to deal with any of the complexity with it. You can scale this kind of endlessly. I've heard of multi terabyte instances and it, it really zeroes out a lot of the complexity with, uh, when it comes to scaling Redis. And there are some other cloud features and I call this the pay the bills slide. I'm an employee of Redis, so I've got to talk, I'm going to want to talk about this a little bit. Um, you have geo distribution, uh, with active active, basically you could have two active primary shards in different regions so that you have a uh, closer availability for people, uh, for folks trying to write to them. And they'll, they'll eventually, they'll become eventually consistent and they'll work themselves out. You see instances of tremendous throughput. I've, I've heard of case studies where we have customers who use Redis, uh, Redis cloud with hundreds of millions of operations a second. So it's, it, it can scale really infinitely, uh, really almost infinitely. We have five nines availability. It's a multi-cloud product, meaning you can deploy it to AWS, Azure, uh, Google cloud, or you can run it yourself if you have your own on, uh, on-prem solutions and you have access to the Redis modules in the cloud, which I'll get to in a little bit and it has enterprise support. Now that was the pay the bill slide, but I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my own personal experience as a developer advocate. Um, we run a discord server, which, oh, uh, by the way, you should join that discord server. If you have any questions about Redis, me, uh, there's another advocate here, guy who's giving a talk about Bigfoot later. If you, anyone wants to learn about finding Bigfoot, um, but you should join us on discord. We tend we tend to feel a lot of questions about Redis. And we do tend to feel a lot of questions about cluster and sentinels from the community. And I personally write up a lot of complex answers 
trying to help people out, trying to get people there, uh, get folks there. And I usually have this refrain. It's like, or you could just use Redis Cloud and you don't have to worry about any of this stuff. But that's the, sorry, I had to, I just had to do this. This is sort of the sales pitchy part of the, uh, part of the presentation. The rest of this is not. All right. So, so anyway, into the uses of Redis. So I'm going to stop right here and pull the room. Who here has heard of Redis? Okay. So 80%. Who here has used Redis? Okay. Who here has not used Redis as a cache? We have, oh, we have four people. That's great. That is actually, that is, you know, four times as many as I would have expected. <laughs> but anyway, the use of Redis, obviously as a cache, it's the one I can't not talk about. It's the number one most popular usage of Redis. You have really low latency access to things that might've taken you a while to get from your database, or you might've had to pay money for if you're using an API. It's great for repeated operations. As a session state store, well, a lot of people will, a lot of folks will have basically different app services running that are load balancing uh, sessions from a browser and they'll just store the cache, uh, the session state, it, the session state for a particular user in the Redis, ca in Redis and cache it there. So it's a distributed session store with extremely low latency access. Like I said, and I'm gonna say this again, we at Redis measure our, the latency of our commands in microseconds instead of milliseconds. So they're very fast. As a message bus, this is one, and this is, I have, I got a really great quote about this and is, I think is in this slide. Um, but you can use Redis as a message bus. Redis streams, which is a new data structure from Redis 5 that's in Redis, is basically um, allows you to send messages through Redis to your other microservices. You can consume messages either directly out of the stream or as a part of a consumer group. And this is a great quote I saw, I heard two days ago, two days ago, and the other advocate who's here, who's here with me heard it too. Using Redis streams saved our comp company from bankruptcy. I think they were trying to use Kafka and I think it was causing them some problems. So I don't know what that was about, but they said that Redis streams was amazing and I really enjoy Redis streams as a feature. And then as a database, and this is the funny one, because there are, you don't actually need any extra layers of caching if you just use the cache as a database. And there are document structures within Redis that allow you to do all sorts of nice CRUD operations. We'll get to that in a little bit. And there are actually, there's, there's two methods of indexing things. So you can index and actually find things in Redis. And again, we'll get to that in a little bit. So getting into some of the Redis data structures now. So strings, for those of you who raised your hand who had used Redis as a cache, this is the one that you know. They are the simplest Redis data structure. They're a single key mapping to a single value, and they are driven primarily by sets and gets. And you could do appends and increments and all kinds of other things. So for example, who here has seen something like this? No one? Okay, we have one person who's seen like a set before. So set in this instance is a command name that you're issuing to Redis. Foo is the name of the key. Bar is the name of the value. And then I think if I probably blocked off these two bits, I think a lot more people would have seen this, but the X basically is saying, oh, I want to set an expiration time on my key here. So it's an expire option and 50 is the number of uh, seconds that you want to wait to expire it. And then get foo. People have probably seen something like this, but basically that's just the command name and that's the key that you're getting. The next one I want to talk about, uh, the next data structure I really want to talk about is sets. So sets are like mathematical sets, right? They're a collection of Redis strings that aren't ordered and they don't allow any sort of duplication. Now you can run the normal set up, uh, the set combination operations that you would think of like intersections, unions, and differences on them to produce conglomerations of these sets. So, my, the, the loneliest Redis command is sad and sad basically takes a key name, which is your set and it inserts something into it S add. That's really what it means, but we're trying to get sad to catch on. So if anybody is using a Redis set, make sure you use the term sad instead of S sad. S is member. Does anyone think, I think probably most people can guess what this means, but S is member basically is checking to see if Thing one here 
is in my set here. S members, my set is just basically getting the command name is S members and my set is the key name. And it's just trying to pull all the set members out of, uh, out of that set. And then S union basically takes N number of sets. These are these multi-key operations I was talking about earlier, and it combines them and gets the union of those sets, which is basically all of the members that are in each uh, that are in both sets. Now, sorted sets are another set like uh, set like data structure, but they're actually a little bit neater. They have the same rule in that they don't allow duplication of members, but sorted sets also actually allow you to store a score. And that score can be can allow you to read the set in order or in reverse order based on the score. And the order types that you can do, you can go by rank. So that's basically like an index. You can go by score, which is, oh, I want to, I want to measure this thing from one score to the other, or you can go by Lex and by Lex means lexicographically. So if you give all of the members of your set, the same score, you can now actually order them and do perform range operations on them alphabetically. So it allows you to do alphabetical ordering of things that are in your set. Example of a sorted set add command is Z add. This is, this doesn't have any sort of fun, sad, uh, name that I can give it, but it's Z add. Um, you have a key name. So in this case, it's like users. So what's the last time that someone, uh, someone visited our site was you can pass it a score, which in this case, I'm just giving it a timestamp. And then I can say, Steve visited this website at this timestamp. And I don't know if that timestamp was like, it might've been a couple weeks ago, or it might've been. 30 years ago, I don't remember, but uh, it's some, some random time that I pulled out, but anyway, but you could, you can add a bunch of different, you know, people to the set and then see, and then order them on the score and, and perform range operations on it. It's kind of nice. And then Z range. So Z range allows you to basically order things by their index and this one right here. So Z range users colon last visited allows you to go from zero to negative one, which if you had, if you hadn't guessed basically is, oh, it, give me the whole sorted set. It's all the, uh, negative one is a special, um, special index allows you to go all the way to the end of the set. So if you're going from the beginning to the end, and then you have, oh, I guess I didn't do a Z range with scores, but if you want to do a Z range with scores, you can do that too. Um, you would just pass in the start and stop time that you're looking at now hashes are where we, things start to get kind of interesting. And I put a dictionary up there because they're basically dictionaries of strings. They're field value stores that are contained in a single key and they're really appropriate for flatter objects that you would want to store in Redis. They're field names and they're basically field names and values. And those field names and values are Redis strings. So each set is the set command for a hash. I'm passing in my key name, which is dog colon one. I'm passing in a field name, which is name, uh, honey, which is the name of my dog and breed greyhound. So this basically pull, uh, produces in Redis a, what a hash map, right? It produces like this hash map, like data structure in Redis that you can use to store things like very flat objects. Each get then allows you to pull out individual fields within, um, a hash. So in this case, I'm just pulling dog colon, dog colon one's name, which would be honey. And then Jason is another data structure, which if you all probably guessed it is storing basically Jason data as, uh, objects in Redis. So you basically store full Jason objects in Redis, and then you can access them by, uh, via their Jason path. And this is, you can access them as you could read them, or you can update them via their JSON path. And this is available within a Redis module. And I'm just going to take a second out here to explain to you what a Redis module is. Um, there's a module API that sits on top of Redis that allows you to extend Redis. Anybody can write one. My company Redis produces several of them that we think are really particularly useful for the community. And you can use them for free under a source available license, as long as you're not selling a database product. So these are something that you can use. You just can't use them in like elastic cash or try to try to sell a database product yourself uh, if you're doing this. So, uh, the JSON dot set command is 
basically, this one is basically doing the same thing as the hset command that we looked at before. But in this case, we're passing in the key name, the path, which is just the root path, the dollar sign. And then I'm passing in basically a Redis string, which has the same information as, I, uh, as we saw before. With JSON get, we can do essentially the same thing we were doing before with an H set, but instead of passing in a um, breed as the field name that we want to pull out, I'm passing in the path, which is dollar sign dot breed. Now what makes this really nice is you can start storing really rich objects and persist them in Redis in the state that you would expect them to be in. And then you can go back in and you can do an, you can do updates and stuff on them without having to uh, fidget with things. So they're really nice data structures. They're kind of, they're needed for folks, a lot of folks to use. I particularly like uh, JSON. Now streams. Now streams are that, that log story that I told you the story before about how the person's business was saved by Redis streams. Well, streams basically implement a log, uh, log data structure. And it allows you to send messages through the streams to a, as a, basically a message queue, almost like a Kafka-like thing. Now, messages consist of an ID and a list of field value pairs. So it almost looks a lot like a hash, but unlike a hash, it allows duplications because it's a list of key value pairs. Um, it's, not a, it's not actually like a dictionary or hash or anything. And then you have consumer groups within, um, within a particular stream that allow you to uh, coherently read things from the stream. So just an example of a stream ID, um, when you insert something into a stream, you can either pass in a, a pass in a stream ID that looks like this, or you could pass in star. And we'll, I'll show you an example of that in a little bit. But basically, basically what the stream ID is, it's two components. It has a timestamp and it has an incrementer. This timestamp is in milliseconds. So the increments are over here is for if you had more than one insertion into the stream in a particular millisecond. And why is that? Because at Redis, we measure the execution times in microseconds and not milliseconds. So it is entirely possible that you could have a particular stream ID get multiple insertions in the same, mill in the same millisecond, which is, I think, kind of impressive. There are some special IDs to consider when you come to, uh, when it comes to streams. Um, and here's a little table. For XAD, the important one is star, because it allows you to basically tell Redis, I don't feel like coming out with a, I don't feel like coming out with a timestamp, could you just come up with one for me? And that's perfectly acceptable for most folks. There's the dollar sign, which is used for an X read, which basically says, all right, Redis, I'm reading the stream. Uh, give me the next one that comes in and it allows you to block waiting for the next message to come in. You have, um, I guess that's a, that's a less than sign. Is that a less than sign? Yes. Yes. All right. It's a we're going with less than sign for X three group and X three group is basically you have, you have a consumer that is part of a, a group of other consumers that might be in different processes and it's just telling me, get me the next message or messages for that group. And then you have uh, minus and plus, which are the lowest and highest uh, possible IDs. So the lowest is like below zero, I think. And the highest is a very large number. I guess it's infinite, infinite. Um, so this command right here, xadd, is showing you an example of what you might do. So you might have a piece of equipment out in the field somewhere that you want to send temperature data to a particular stream through. So you would send it for this particular sensor and you would pass it the ID star, a uh, field name and, and field value. So temperature is 27, right? And then for an X read, you basically would pass in um, the command name. And then you need to say, you need to indicate when the streams, um, when the stream keys are starting and you pass in a dollar sign, which is that special ID that I was telling you about before for reading only new messages. And usually you, usually you would add a block to the end here to tell it to wait for a certain period of time before you actually complete the read. X read group allows you to basically read out of a group of, cons uh, out of a consumer group. And in this case, basically we're pulling from a group name for a group name. So this group name is average. So maybe you're averaging a bunch of numbers 
uh, the consumer name, consumer's name is a consumer within that group and the key name and then the ID, which is telling me, oh, get only the new messages for this consumer group. So those are some of the key Redis data structures. And there are lots of other ones that I didn't get to. And if you'd like to know, learn more about those, we are sponsoring this conference. So stop by the booth and I will gladly talk to you ad nauseum about them. But in the interest of time, let's move on to some Redis design patterns. Now, round trip management is, in my personal opinion, the most important thing for ensuring your um, the alacrity of your commands in Redis. Now, what do I mean by uh, round trip management? Well, the root of most bottlenecks in, in Redis are round trips. So like I've said before, op times in, in Redis are measured in microseconds. But RTTs, or round trip times, in to Redis are usually measured in milliseconds. So the more important thing here is to make sure we minimize the number of round trips that we make to Redis. Yes, minimize number of round trips. Uh, so, oh yeah, so the two ways you can optimize this are lowering the round trip time or minimizing the number of round trips. That's what I was trying to get at, sorry. And there's a couple of ways to do this. Variadic commands, um, for those of you that don't, that don't know what variadic means, it just means that your command can have multiple numbers of variables. You can have a variable number of variables. So many commands are variadic. So like the H set command I showed you before, the X reads I showed you, I think the X adds, they're all variadic commands that allow you to pass in multiple fields. Uh, or multiple different things. So you don't have to make multiple round trips to complete the same set of operations. So if you see yourself calling the same thing over and over again in Redis, you might wanna check to just make sure that there is the command that you're using isn't variadic or there's not some way to make, there's not some other command that allows it to be variadic. So leveraging variacity, uh, the variacity, variadicity, I, I don't think I'm pronouncing that right. The variaticness of a command of commands allows you to basically minimize the number of round trips that you're making to the Redis server. And this one, I, I, I just think this is a funny thing, but always be pipelining. So what does pipelining mean? Well, you can send multiple commands to Redis simultaneously, um, basically in the set, same set of packets. And this is really appropriate when the intermediary results between commands aren't that important to you. You might care at the end of the day, like what all what the disposition of all your commands were, but you might be perfectly content to send a hundred sets to Redis uh, without actually um, caring about what the intermediary results were. So where possible pipeline, this can really dramatically increase uh, throughput. I've had customers before who uh, basically were adding like a thousand things to Redis and it, it, adding a thousand things, if you were not pipelining, would take, well, a thousand X to round trip time, which is usually, you know, in the order of milliseconds. So it was seconds, right? They were talking about if they were pipelining, it would take them like two milliseconds. So always be pipelining where possible. In general, the various Redis clients support some form of pipelining. So always consider pipelining if you have a lot of commands that you're running that you are not sure certain that you really need the intermediary results for. So object storage, and I've kind of alluded this to a couple times already. Well, you could do different types of document storage and there's really three models of document storage. The first one is hashes. That's that nice flat data structure that we, uh, that we looked at before where you could store basically a dictionary in Redis. You can have an extensible dictionary in Redis. Then there's raw JSON. So you just use a set command to dump a bunch of JSON data into Redis. And people, that's actually been a really popular pattern for many years. And then you can use the JSON data structure that I showed you all before. So hashes are a native flat data structure within Redis. And each set, which is very attic by the way, can be allowed to use, uh, can be used to update and delete. And then you can use hget, hmget, or hget all to get fields within a particular hash. hget gets one, hmget is very attic and allows you to get many. hget all just pulls the whole hash back for you. 
then hdel and unlink are basically what you can use to delete fields or entire objects within Redis. The pros of it are that it's native and really performant, and the cons of it are that it really breaks down when you get down to more complicated objects, and the patterns for storing collections, particularly arrays within a Redis hash, are a, uh, not great. It's not great is, uh, is what I'm going to tell you. Then there's JSON blobs. So you could just use the native data structure, a string, and just dump a lot of JSON data into it. So use a set to create or update, and you use get to read, and use unlink to delete it. So they're obviously the command set for this are very simple. The big, uh, the big pro is that it's native and simple, and your input is probably in this format already. This is usually, this is what happens a lot. The big problem though, is that updates are really expensive and reads are really expensive because if you want to update, you have to query the entire string to serialize it, make an update to it, re-serialize it, and send it back to Redis. It's kind of an expensive group of, of operations. And then reads are expensive because you have to basically pull the entire object back. You can't just read a single, uh, single bit out of it. You have to pull the whole object back and deserialize it. And then the JSON data structure, we kind of went over it before. This exists within the Redis JSON module. Uh, JSON set allows you to create or, uh, create or update, JSON get to read, and JSON del to remove fields, and then unlink to delete. So the pros of this obviously are there. All operations are fast, and it's organized and uh, relatively easy to update. Uh, it's, it's easy to update and delete stuff within the, um, the data structure. And it works really well with rich objects. The con is that you need to use that module. You can't use it in like Elastic Cache or uh, Memory DB or any of those other uh, Redis, and Redis types. Now, finding stuff in Redis is where things get really interesting. So indexing, basically um, finding, an, finding anything in Redis by value requires you to build a secondary index of some type. And there's two, there's two ways to do this. You can either do this with sorted sets and sets, or you can do this with Redis search, which is another one of those modules I was telling you about before. Sorted sets allows you to const uh, construct sorted sets into an index. Uh, for example, um, what is it? I would have a set called person colon first name colon Steve, and that set would contain um, the a score of zero and a member of person colon one. And that would be like, oh, I can now find all the people named Steve by querying this thing. So, and then you'd have like person colon age, and then you would give it the age, which still 32 for another two days, but almost 33, and then person colon one. And then you can query things with Z range commands. So, and this allows for complex queries with set up. Uh, Sorry, with with the set out uh, combination commands. Basically, you can do like uh, a Z union and then or Z intersect between the two sets to create a more uh, an in a more interesting result. Where if you want to find all the people over thirty three and all the all the Steves. So the pro of this is that it's native in any Redis uh, instance. It's relatively performant. The con is that it's really tricky to maintain, like really tricky to maintain, particularly with any kind of consistency. And you are not able to do this across shards with any guarantee atomicity. Or Redis search basically allows you to predefine the index that you're going to use and then just use the JSON or hash commands to create your objects. So for example, I would just set this person, Steve, still 32. And to find something, I would just query with the Redis syntax, uh, Redis search syntax. And so this query right here is basically finding all the Steves that are between 31 and 33. So it's a lot simpler to wrap your head around. And the nice thing is, is that this is fast, it is easy to use, and it allows you to um, index across shards relatively easily. And then the big con is that you need to use uh, re uh, separate Redis modules to make this happen. So transactions and scripts basically allow you to apply multiple commands to a server atomically. They start with a multi. So basically you issue the multi command, you issue all the commands, and then you execute the block of commands within the transaction with an exec. And then you can issue watches to watch particular keys to make sure things aren't messed up while your transaction's in flight. 
And if all the commands are valid, they will execute, uh, the, the transaction will execute there. The problem with the transaction verbiage though, is that like, if you have uh, type errors within your transactions, they can still execute and they don't stop executing. So it doesn't, it doesn't actually have any sort of rollback. So you gotta be careful with transactions. There's great articles about them in Redis IO if you wanna learn more about them. What I always recommend people use are not transactions. I recommend they use Lewis scripts. Lewis scripts allow you to uh, allow scripted execution atomically. And they allow you to use the intermediary results within your Redis, within your Redis script without having to worry about whether the thing has been mucked with since you started uh, working with it. And this is an example of a Redis script. So I basically am coming up with a new, with, I'm, I'm basically, I basically want to have an auto incrementing ID. And so I would call um, incur on my next ID key and I would use the result of that, that intermediary result to produce a new uh, key name for my next set. So I, then I would call a set with key with a value. Now, here comes the fun part, adding Redis to your app. So the Redis wire protocol or Redis wire call protocol or RESP, which stands for Redis serialization protocol is how you would use your app to talk to Redis. And usually 90% of the time, 99% of the time you would use a client to, uh, to wrap this. And then for these Redis uh, lower level commands, you would have basically different clients. Examples of these you may have heard of before are Jetis, Node Redis, Redis Pi, Stack Exchange Redis, or for the Java community, Lettuce is a popular one that I believe is part of the Spring product project. And um, there is also Redisin, which is another really popular one. Now, I only have nine minutes left, so I'm gonna go quickly go through some of the gotchas and anti-patterns. Keys, please do not use the keys command in production. Keys command can lock up a Redis instance in a hurry. Um, using a, use a cursor based scan instead. I could not tell you how many people we've had say, oh, my, my Redis instance is deadlocked. Oh, what command are you running against it? Keys, how many keys do you have in your uh, database? I have 4 billion keys. The keys command has to iterate over all of them and return them all to you in order to complete. So please don't use the keys command. Uh, reuse connections. The expensive thing with, uh, the expected thing about connecting to Redis is opening TCP sockets. So those, it, it, opening this can be really expensive. So pool your connections where possible. Most uh, client libraries take care of this for you. So pull your pool where possible. The single biggest anti-pattern that we run into is hot keys. So single keys with very heavy access patterns um, tend to prop, prop, uh, prop up in production. You can check your hot keys with the Redis CLI hot keys and you can mitigate them by scale, uh, taking advantage of scale Redis clusters or by considering duplicating those keys across multiple keys. Um, and also consider client side caching, that's really useful. All right, so I only have seven minutes left and we're gonna get, we're now at the demo portion of this. So as I promised before, I would give you all a choice. Um, would you rather see me, all right, I'll give you all three options. Would you rather I use .NET, which I'm, I consider myself somewhat competent in? Would you rather I use um, the, the CLI and you could just see me use the Redis commands? Or would you rather I struggle with Java and you'd be highly entertained? Java. All right, all right. Java, Java, raise your hand. <sighs> all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. All right, so predicting this, <laughs> predicting this, I did have, I did have a, an IntelliJ instance installed and set up on my machine. I don't know how to, I don't know, really know how to use IntelliJ that well, but I'll get to it. So the first thing you need to do with IntelliJ here is you need to create an instance of Jetis. So Jetis is the thing I'm using here. If you look in my POM file, you'll see that I have um, Jetis installed right here. It's this bit right here. Um, the first thing you need to do is initialize, a, I'm gonna initialize a Jetis pool. This is gonna take care of that pooling I talked about before. So Jetis pool, pool equals new Jettis pool. No, not new Jettis pool. And then I got to pass in a Redis URL. So Redis colon forward slash forward slash localhost colon 6379. Now in the background, I have 
Redis Stack Running, um, which is a group, which is basically open source Redis and a bunch of modules around it. Um, basically running to, uh, in the background, it's listening on 6379, which is the traditional port of Redis. So to use, to use something from a Redis pool, I am gonna use a try. I only know about the try operation because I'm a .NET developer and I look for the corollary of using. And Jettis, Jettis equals pool dot get resource. And that allows me to pull out a Jettis instance. Oh, wait, hold on, there's something wrong here. There's something gone terribly wrong here, thank you. Oh, thank God. Oh, oh. Oh. That was really, that was triggering me, I'm sorry. All right, so to use a string command, you would use like Jettis dot set or set and then you would say like foo bar and that's it. That's all you gotta do. That's when my tech talk, no, I'm just kidding. Um, and then to get to get that foo again, I would just do a string foo equals jettis dot get and pass in foo, which is the name of the thing I wanted. And I can do a console dot write line. Oh wait, no, this is Java. I could do a uh, system dot out O out the print line and I can print foo. And I'm sorry, this is just, I, I know this is infinitely entertaining for folks. All right, and you see it printed out bar down here. There we go. Now, the trick is, um, the reason I want to use Jettis pool and not, uh, and not just a regular instance of Jettis is because I want to show you the pooling. The other thing I, pro I, I told you with the patterns before that you really want to be careful of is you want to always be pipelining. So I guess I'll show some, I guess I'll show a little bit of that too. So um, instead of this, I'm going to do jettis.pool.get resource. And then that, I think it's pipeline, pipelined. And I think I, I think I just have to call this a pipeline. Pipeline, jettis. All right, cool. And now I can run multiple jettis commands. So I can say jettis.set foo bar jettis dot set bar baz. And the thing is, is that I've now queued up multiple commands to this pipeline here. And the only thing I need to do to complete this is say jettis dot sync. And that'll synchronize that pipeline. And it'll issue all of the commands to Redis and allow you to run all of your commands together. Um, a couple of other fun things. I guess I, I guess I have a little bit of time to go over. Uh, I will do a, to set a member or to use sets. Okay. You would do like a uh, Jettis dot S add sad, sad. We're, we're bringing back sad. All right. Jettis dot sad, um, my set. And then I can add foo bar Baz, and then I can just do a Jettis dot get members or set members my set, and you don't have vars, so how, what's the return type in this? Oh, so this will eventually return a set of strings, and you know I'll just change this to a Jettis instance. Do you have VAR, you have VARs in a? Oh, I'm, I don't know. I'm using whatever was on my computer. I'm, I am not, I am not the person to talk to you about Java. I'm not the person to talk to you about Java, but I'm doing my best and I hope you all appreciate that. But anyway, so I can just assign this to a set of, um, set string members equals that. And that'll basically pull all the members back for me. And unfortunately, I, I, I kind of ran out of time here. Um, it's, it's now 1210. But if you want to learn more about using Redis, uh, you come talk to us. We're up at, we're upstairs at our booth. Uh, so, and I hope you've all found this valuable. I'll be up here for questions for a couple of minutes before they kick me out. But yeah, so thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much for coming. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>